Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh History of Medicine seminar series. You can get news of our latest events if you follow us on Twitter at RCP Heritage. We hope you enjoy the talk. Okay, as, as Ian said, I did talk previously on specifically did James III have porphyria or not? And um, really summarising uh, the previous uh, uh, talk very briefly, um, mother and son psychiatrists, uh, Andrew McAlpine, claimed that George III had acute porphyria, acute intermittent porphyria, and they later changed the diagnosis to uh, the rarer, about a third less uh, common, and porphyria itself is a pretty rare disease, and it's a much milder condition, much less likely to have psychiatric or uh, toxic confusional um, complications. Um, uh, I, uh, over a period of time, re-examined all the medical records. The thing about George III is there's a hundred volumes of medical records in various sites, and I went through this, and as I mentioned last time, showed that they were highly selective, uh, economical with the truth, I think is the term, and they clearly um, were wrong with their uh, claim. And a re-evaluation of the records, and did this with um, Alan Beveridge uh, from uh, uh, Fife, and uh, I think we clearly showed that he didn't have porphyria and he had uh, recurrent attacks of acute mania. And I thought, well, that's it. Go on and do something uh, different, something more useful perhaps. But... Uh, the historians have said, well, that's all right, you, you know, uh, we don't think George III had the condition, but what about James VI, what about um, uh, Queen Victoria, the Duke of Kent, and all these other people that they claimed had uh, porphyria? Well, it seemed to me that if George didn't have it, it was a pointless exercise and very unlikely that anybody else had it, but that wasn't good enough for the historians. They say, you know, who are you against uh, Dame Lady Antonia Fraser? So for this reason, I've actually carried on and looked at some other um, members. Uh, before I uh, move on to other members, I thought I'd just show you some recent stuff that um, uh, Alan and I did, uh, which sort of sets a bit of a sub-theme for the talk. I'm very keen to move away from, this is my opinion, that's your opinion, well, let's just sort of toss it in the air, can we be more objective and more, as it were, scientific in our historical diagnosis? And this is an attempt to look at um, uh, James uh, uh, George's three episodes, 1788, 1801, and the final episode, uh, 1810, uh, uh, 1811, using uh, a, a tool. And this is the Opcrit tool that Peter McGuffin um, developed, uh, specifically for looking at... Um, uh, psychiatric patients and I actually gave a talk at the College of Psychiatrists and I was rather nervous again because he was in the audience but he was actually rather flattered he said this uh, tool was develop developed for looking at uh, case notes we didn't think it would be used for case notes 200 years old but at least he was uh, uh, and this is what uh, you, you put in uh, into the computer program the various signs and symptoms of the patient you press a button and it comes up with the uh, suggested diagnosis with the various criteria, the DSM-3, various possibilities, ICD-10, RDC, and you can see that for each of the episodes we're coming up with acute mania, uh, plus or minus uh, psychosis, and interestingly in the final episode before the, uh, he uh, developed probably a form of dementia, um, at the age of um, 70 when the regency was established, uh, if anything uh, psychiatrically the mania was rather minor, uh, less severe as hypermania. And this is a theme I want to try and develop. Let's get away from, this is my opinion, we need to be much more objective in uh, historical diagnosis. The other thing we can do is to try to quantitate the severity of his mania. And again, this is um, uh, the young mania scale. It was actually Tim Crow, who you, you I'm sure will remember, uh, suggested that this was worth uh, an, an attempt. And what we've done here is, unfortunately, there was not, um, he wasn't looked at during this uh, 1788 uh, 89 episode uh, by a single ob observer so we've had to sort of pool the results initially from George Baker then uh, his uh, equerry uh, Robert Grenville and finally the psychiatrists or what they called at that time the mad doctors the Willis family 
and produced a sort of aggregate score. Um, and uh, you can see he reaches a scale of about 40. This is the severity scale, and a, uh, a figure of uh, 40 is definitely, in, in the peak of the episode, uh, a grade uh, 4 uh, acute amania. And, and I, again, we try whenever possible now to use these scales, and I'll mention some of it uh, a bit later. Well, um, briefly, the uh, tree, and these are some of the people. So here's George. And we're going to look at um, his grandson, August Esther, who was the son, so-called illegitimate son, of uh, the Duke of, uh, of Sussex. And I say we, we've only looked at individuals where there is good clinical data, not just odd letters and hints, but where there is good uh, sort of observation. So I've looked at um, Augustus, the nature of his condition. He was claimed to have porphyria. And you can see that there's a gap of five generations when we come back to James VI. And again, there is good data, clinical information on James VI. So we're going to look at him as well. Anyway, let's start off with... Um, uh, Augusta Esther. He was the son of uh, Prince Augustus Frederick. He was the sixth son of um, George III. He had actually recurrent attacks of uh, asthma in uh, early life, in childhood, adolescence, and, and, and 20s and 30s, and spent most of his time on the continent. And while he was in uh, the, on the continent, he met um, uh, Augusta Murray, married. Uh, in, uh, in, in Italy and actually had two children, a son and a daughter. Uh, this infuriated George III because he wanted to, the Royal Marriages Act, he wanted to dictate who all his children uh, married and he managed, he claimed, to get the wedding annulled and this obviously caused uh, a lot of angst for various members of the family. Anyway, at the age of 28, Augustus developed a, a sort of relapsing, progressive neurological condition, visual disturbance, paraplegia, impotence, but no cerebellar signs. And this, as we'll see, has been claimed to be the first uh, recorded case of um, multiple sclerosis. Now, Hunter McAlpine claimed that the multiple sclerosis uh, was atypical. And in, you can see there are no real cerebellar signs. So uh, from ordinary uh, textbooks, there is a, an atypicality. And th but they have said that the atypicality confirms that, in fact, he had porphyria. You know, leaping where angels did to fret. Well, let's look at the more detail. So the differential diagnosis, I say, most of the history textbooks and most books do say this is the first recorded case of multiple sclerosis. The data is, is really quite extensive because from the age of 20 to the age of nearly 50, he kept a very detailed diary in which he wrote down his symptomatology, the doctors he saw, their advice and their diagnosis. So there's good information and he obviously was quite an astute observer. So I say, most of the textbooks uh, would say that he had multiple sclerosis. However, there are this, the atypical features I think suggests uh, um, a condition, Devix disease uh, or neuromyelitis optica, which for many years was thought just to be a variant of multiple sclerosis. But as we'll hear, it's um, a specific disease in its own right. And of course, um, Hunter McAlpine said this atypicality was in fact the neurological manifestations of variegate porphyria. And if the grandson had it, that confirmed that uh, dear old George had it. Uh, so we've used this um, uh, neurological database, this uh, computer program, it's called Simul Consult, uh, developed in, um, by Michael Siegel in the States. Uh, it's a neurological database which provides a weighted differential diagnosis. It compares, you put in the patient's symptoms, I say it's all been used up till date on, on sort of living uh, patients, it's used as a diagnostic aid, um, and it compares the patient's symptoms of the database of about 2,500 neurological syndromes. And uh, Michael claims it involves cognitive uh, errors and helps make the diagnosis more accurate and, being an American, uh, much more cost-effective. As we see, it gives you a differential diagnosis. And in fact, you can link the differential diagnosis to uh, or adjust the differential diagnosis by the relative incidence of the disease. And we'll see this with um, um, Augustus.
and that's a reference if anybody's interested. It is available, you just need to sign on, log on, and you can get download this, and uh, it's quite interesting. If you talk to the neurologists, the young school of neurologists use it, but the old school neurologists say they don't need to, it's all up here, you see. Um, but, you know, say we thought it would be useful to try this. In this. So this is what we put in. We put in... Here, uh, in 53-year-old male, no family history of similar illnesses. He had urinary symptoms, visual impairment, gait disturbance, hyperalgesia, particularly a sort of paraplegic type symptom. He complains particularly an episode of uh, recurrent uh, impotence, um, but no uh, dysarthria, no tremor, no ataxia. Uh, he had recurrent exacerbations, and the question is, what's the differential diagnosis for this clinical syndrome, and I'm sure you'll all know the answer. <laughs> and if you do this, uh, you come up uh, with number one diagnosis of Devix disease or neuromyelitis optica, and the second diagnosis is multiple uh, sclerosis. We now know that, I say, for when I was a student in St Andrews, you know, it was a, a form of multiple sclerosis or a particularly a different variant. We now know it's a completely different uh, disorder, a, sort of a, an autoimmune disease um, in which an antibody is formed against uh, aquaporin-4, which interferes with blood-brain barrier sort of function. So it's quite a distinct uh, disease. But it's a much rarer disease. About 5% of patients with so-called multiple sclerosis have actually this condition. So we can actually uh, put this relative incidence in, and if you do that, as you might expect, uh, multiple sclerosis comes up as the number one diagnosis with Devic's disease, number two diagnosis. So you, you can certainly in practice uh, put in the relative incidence of the condition. Uh, I think it's a little bit artificial, but it does indicate it, how it is particularly uh, used. Uh, the important thing to note is that variegate porphyria is nowhere. Um, inter uh, maybe down here, somewhere down towards two and a half thousand. Acute intermittent porphyria uh, is sort of mentioned, but you can see the relative probability is pretty uh, pretty negligible, and these are the other conditions that uh, uh, in the batting order, but I say it goes down to about two and a half, uh, two and a half thousand. So summarizing then, I think this is the first use of the Simul Consult program to look at the differential diagnosis of a historical figure. So it's used increasingly in uh, cl clinical neurological practice and comes up with um, Devic's disease or neuromyelitis optica and multiple sclerosis as the most likely diagnosis. And the probability in any particular population, obviously is partially reflected by the relative uh, uh, frequency, the fact that um, multiple sclerosis is probably 20 times or so more common than uh, Devic's disease. Uh, but the important thing from my point of view, the object of the exercise, is that variegate porphyria, which is what Hunter McAlpine claimed uh, Augustus had, is uh, pretty well uh, uh, excluded. Right, now I'd like to move on to James the Sixth. So this is uh, uh, largely, I think, for my benefit, actually. I'm sure everybody knows this and will be able to correct any errors in it. Uh, the sort of major features, um, Mary Queen of Scots, obviously, was his mother, and people have claimed that she had the problem. Uh, very dysfunctional childhood in the first couple of years. Uh, crowned King of Scotland at 13 months. A series of uh, regency uh, regencies educated by the province principal of St Andrews at the time, who gave him a fairly rough time. Obviously, the execution of his mother and the sort of uh, um, uh, his attitude to it. I mean, I'm sure the uh, psychiatrist will be very interested in the uh, accounts of his uh, uh, attitude to uh, the question of his, his mother's execution and the relationship between her execution and his uh, uh, cited aim, which was to succeed Queen Elizabeth. He marries uh, five children, uh, three of whom reach adulthood. Um, this is obviously important if you come to look at the genetics of the condition. He succeeds uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, fairly um, straightforward, uh, involved very much in the uh, gunpowder plot one way or another. A tragic death of his um, eldest son Henry, probably of um, typhoid, death of his wife, each of these uh, events triggered a relapse in his symptomatology. 
we're able to study him, although we're talking, you know, two, three hundred years ago, because there is a fantastic medical report by his physician, Theodore de Mayen, and I'll say a little bit about him. And he dies um, in 1625, and because it was believed that he was poisoned, a post-mortem was performed, so we do have some additional information. Uh, one or two pictures. This is a picture of him as a, as a, as a child, uh, rather pale, uh, delicate skin that people demand comments on. The, the paediatricians have commented on his fingers as a sort of uh, po uh, possible fusion of two of the digits, but I've never seen any mention of that. But, um, and painting hands is, is really quite difficult, so I don't know. But uh, certainly um, some people have used the portraits uh, in their differential uh, diagnosis. Here's a, the last portrait of him before he moved to England, a rather, I have to say, rather shady-looking character, but, uh, you know. And this is Theodore de Mayen, who was an interesting chap. He was a Swiss a Huguenot physician, trained in, um, came from Switzerland, cha trained uh, in Germany and in, in uh, Paris. Uh, sorry, in Montpellier, because he was um, not Catholic, he sort of left uh, uh, France and came to England, and he was obviously a very able person. He set up the um, uh, Society of Apothecaries, he set up the first uh, pharmacopoeia in the Royal College of Physicians, really very able, and the quality of his uh, uh, clinical papers and clinical reports are fantastic. And um, we're uh, very much indebted to him. Um, and he wrote uh, in 1623, uh, just two or three years before George III died, a medical report. And he wrote this report because he was summoned back to Switzerland for, on family business. And he didn't have very much opinion of the sort of the local British chaps. And so he wrote this medical report with advice what to do while I'm away. Unfortunately, uh, he was away for a, quite a long period of time, uh, and, the, and the king fell ill, and the doctors totally ignored all the advice, and uh, poor old James died. I'm not sure of the cause or effect relationship, but he wrote this many-paged uh, uh, report, and it's in the British Library in Sloan Manuscripts, and uh, written in Latin. Now, interestingly, Moore, Michael Moore, in about 1895, translated this report, but only partially, and I can't understand that. He said, I'm giving you a partial translation of this medical report to give you a sort of feeling of it, a sort of the sense of what the report is like. And everybody's used this partial translation. And it seemed to me that, you know, you've got to get all the data. You can't just sort of be selected. And fortunately, a, a couple of uh, colleagues, um, uh, Terry Hunt, uh, and, and was able to complete the translation. So we actually have a full translation filling in a few relatively minor gaps, but nevertheless was important. So we do actually have a full uh, uh, account of the, uh, of the report. Well, what do we get from the medical history? Well, this is trying to summarize, I say, 20, 30 pages of Latin text as I mentioned, uh, very much a dysfunctional childhood. You can imagine the social workers would be all over him these days. Uh, between the ages, uh, delayed walking, he was able, unable to walk properly until uh, probably between the age of five and seven, and there was persistent um, uh, weakness, difficulty in, in walking and a, a peculiar gait for the, really, uh, the rest of his life. There were various movement, uh, dystonias, etc., movement, behavior, and behavior disorders. Uh, comments uh, that his tongue was too large for his mouth, difficulty in speaking, uh, difficulty in swallowing, t t describes that he actually ate his drink, which is quite interesting. Now, when I discussed this with a distinguished um, historian, she said uh, the speech difficulties was that he talked in broad Scots, and nobody could understand it in England, but uh, uh, I wouldn't like to comment on that one. But uh, certainly there are you know, orofacial uh, issues to be considered. He had recurrent episodes of, of renal colic, and he describes the, the this is again Demayan, describes the passage of um, 
uh, uh, urinary calculi as a sort of bloody red crumbly sand and I think this tells us something about the nature of the uh, renal uh, stones. They weren't large single calcium white uh, whitish stones, they were described as red crumbly yellowy crumbly sand like material and he clearly has episodes of um, urinary tract infection uh, describes uh, this in great detail. He has, has gouty arthritis. Now, gout in those days meant many things, but he describes in particular the gout of the great, the big toe of his left foot, and difficulty in walking. We've commented already on the skin, uh, a very scanty beard, which I think will may come relevant later. Uh, recurrent episodes of diarrhea. Again, this very unlike uh, porphyria patients with porphyria. Uh, you know, they, they don't have diarrhea, uh, hemorrhoids. Uh, I think he misused alcohol, and that may contribute to uh, help in the diagnosis. Um, possibly, I think a recent book um, in the States, that Michael Young uh, would say probably bisexual. Significance, not terribly clear, but uh, interesting. Uh, De Mayen comments that he was prone to hypochondriac uh, uh, melancholy, whatever me melancholy, whatever that is, and certainly from between 1619 and 1625, there was a progressive intellectual impairment. People, uh, there's been quite a good study by um, Holmes and Williams in the States, where they analysed his letters using techniques we call um, um, cognitive archaeology, where you can actually look at uh, people's texts and actually show an intellectual deterioration when you look at the vocabulary, the uh, complicated complexity of the uh, sentences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And somebody's done this with the letters over the over his life, and in particular from about 1620 to 25, there clearly is good evidence of intellectual impairment. Well, what people have suggested, well, uh, the first suggestion was that he had rickets. This was the cause of his uh, weakness and the difficulty in walking uh, due to Helen Littell, his wet nurse who looked after him for the first year of life, was said to be an alcoholic. Uh, and I say variegate porphyria is what uh, McAlpine put forward. And I say many other people are uh, repeating this repeatedly. Uh, uh, Beasley in New Zealand suggested that as well as porphyria, he had evidence of cerebral palsy and caused the weakness. Um, uh, Holmes, a um, retired physician in the States, suggested he had uh, an, a hereditary neuromuscular disorder because there was some evidence that uh, Charles, for example, had uh, was a late uh, late walker, and he suggested Charcot Marie Tooth. But this doesn't uh, explain many of the other. Um, uh, issues. Um, I discussed this with a, guy, a, a dental colleague, and please to see there's a dentist in the audience, so she might have some comments on this. Uh, there's a fantastic book, Gorin's books, of oral cleft defects and large numbers of uh, syndromes of the um, uh, head and neck and that, and he came up with this as a, as a possibility. But again, it only partially describes some of the symptomatology, not the whole whole picture. So, Simul Consult came to our aid at this point, uh, and the, this, we put in just the sort of the basic information. Here we have a 59-year-old male, we're talking about when he uh, was under the care of um, uh, Saul de Mayen in 1619. Uh, 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 motor development delay which was present, he had difficulty walking uh, ever really since uh, uh, childhood, uh, renal stones, which uh, really became a significant problem from the age of 40. He had abnormal speech, uh, but the onset, it was present, but onset. So a fairly sort of broad um, net was used. So we put this into the computer and pressed the button. And obviously I was looking for porphyria, and nowhere are any of the porphyrias. So I thought, well, you know, that's fine, we'll go home now. But up came this diagnosis of Lechnian disease. Now, Lechnian disease is a pretty rare genetic defect. Uh, when I was with the MRC at Northwick Park, uh, Richard Watts uh, had uh, about half a dozen cases of this disorder, Lechnian syndrome. About 20, 
All right, sorry, 20. <laughs> I knew there was... Well, you probably know more about it than me, but he had people with, with this, with the, what's called the severe neurological picture, and it was a really pretty nasty uh, condition with a lot of dystonia, with self-mutilation, and a really disturbing uh, problem. Although, interestingly, Nyan, who... who um, uh, with Lesh reported the case initially commented that if you went in the old days when uh, mentally retarded handicapped children were, were in institutions you could pick up the children because they actually look brighter than the average Downs or other, other syndrome, that's what he says, I don't know uh, but I'd only ever seen this condition but more recently people have shown there is a, um, a spectrum ranging from uh, the severe form of uh, Lesch-Nyhan uh, syndrome to pu patients purely with hyperuricemia and renal stones without any neurological problems. And you can see the most likely diagnosis is this mild neurological form of Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. I'd say I, I was particularly uh, obviously concerned, uh, interested in the fact that nowhere do any of the porphyrias come. But I thought it was interesting to, to say, well, you know, I was rather biased because having only seen in Dickie Watts's department this severe case, what about this uh, milder, milder form? Well, um, uh, the person who's the authority at present is um, uh, Haider Jinner in Atlanta, and he has studied large numbers of cases and uh, if anyone's interested I can give you a reference he's got a, a report of about 75 cases of what he calls attenuated or mild lesh disease um, it basically is a very form thrust of the full syndrome uh, there certainly is no self um, uh, mutilation uh, there may be sort of mental handicap, IQ 70, 80, but there are cases of this attenuated form with the, undoubtedly have the disorder, uh, but with IQs, normal IQs, and even IQs, of, I think the highest IQ is about 140. So, have, you know, having this syndrome doesn't, um, uh, you know, indicate that you've got uh, a, a evidence of mental retardation. A little bit about it. Uh, it's an X-linked disorder and a partial deficiency of this enzyme, one of the purine salvage pathways enzymes, explains the increased amount of, uh, of uh, uric acid in the, in the uh, urine. And there's a bit of evidence that you can classify the patients on the amount of activity remaining. So patients with the full-blown syndrome will have less than 1% of the normal activity in their uh, lymphocytes, etc., Patients between uh, 2 and 5% fi uh, will have the mild form, and patients with about 10% or above may only have the uh, renal stones. And in fact, there have been so-called normal individuals who've been identified who have reduced enzyme activity, only about 50% reduction, who to all intents and purposes are absolutely normal. So there's a range of enzyme activity, residual activity, and there's a range of, uh, of, of severity. Um, var variable motor disabilities, they may or may not have cognitive impairment, but interestingly, and I, this is, I sort of became interested in this point, they frequently have uh, what he describes as socially difficult uh, behavior. Another term that he used, if I can remember, in uh, Jenna's book um, was, uh, what he talked about, they were maladaptive. He used the term that these patients with this attenuated form were maladaptive and they had poor attention, impulsivity, poor judgment uh, and some of them uh, went on to have, um, as we'll see, um, part of the autistic spectrum you know and, and we're coming around to does this explain some of the features of James I'm not saying that he absolutely did have this condition but this is the sort of the number one differential diagnosis that comes up certainly on the evidence that we have um, uh, this is the um, uh, neurological and uh, you might say psychological problems uh, they all have ure uh, hyperuricemia uh, with gout which James had renal stones, and it's always um, present if, uh, if untreated. 
And I think, and um, colleagues may uh, disagree or otherwise, that the sort of red, sandy nature of the, the gravel that was produced rather than the uh, single uh, renal calculus is, is uh, consistent with uric acid um, uh, stones. Well, as I say, uh, there is certainly evidence that the attenuated form is associated with autistic features, part of the uh, autistic spectrum uh, disorder. Uh, as far as I can see, psychiatrists every now and then have a, or child psychiatrists every now and then have a sort of party and they reclassify, which is uh, perhaps very helpful for them, but rather confusing for others. Uh, and um, I think uh, if you use DSM-4, that James uh, meets the um, criteria uh, for uh, Asperger's uh, uh, syndrome. And if you use the um, adult Asperger assessment uh, score of Baron Cohen, and it's a bit controversial, uh, he does score in the Asperger range. Uh, this is the data from uh, Baron Cohen's paper, control scoring um, about five, standard deviation of 2.5, patients with full-blown Asperger's 15 plus or minus 2, James scores 12 and the cutoff is about 10, so he would be consistent with uh, a mild form of uh, Asperger's. So then, uh, in, in summary, uh, we've reviewed the medical history of James and again this novel use of this diagnostic um, implement, uh, similar consult, uh, used for historical uh, uh, neurological conditions. Uh, again, reiterating, perhaps ad nauseum, rejecting uh, a diagnosis of porphyria. And uh, surprisingly, and it really shook me when it came up on that, um, the, uh, 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 suggesting an attenuate, attenuated form of Lechmayan disease or Lechmayan syndrome. And he does have some features I think uh, consistent with, uh, with Asperger's. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Alan Beveridge, who many of you I'm sure know, was very helpful with me in using the uh, OPCRIT analysis, Peter Garrard, um, a uh, neurologist at um, St. George's, who actually first suggested using Simul Consult. Uh, Julian, a historian who was uh, very helpful in help guiding me to some of the uh, literature and uh, you know some of the original uh, primary stuff to read. Terry Hunt did the uh, uh, objectively did a read of the Latin um, report by Tomeyan and John uh, Stevenson, who's uh, I think a pediatric neurologist in Glasgow. He also um, uh, was very helpful with the Simul uh, uh, consult because uh, I think it was important that it should be done somewhat objectively, not by myself, you know, with a preconceived idea, particularly looking at uh, De Est, and it's very, very useful to have the help of uh, these various colleagues. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, for your attention. thank you for listening to our History of Medicine lecture series, Case Notes. This podcast has been brought to you by the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. We're a charity, and if you enjoyed today's show, head over to rcpe.ac.uk heritage for more information and how to donate. Thank you.